We are now live. We are now live on Facebook. Okay. We are now live. So is YouTube. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, the Habitat Expert Series. Today, we are going to be looking at our topic, a future for primates in Malaysia. 
Uh, the Habitat Expert Series is a platform which we created to encourage conversations and connections that will lead to effective conservation. Uh, we are really delighted to have a really diverse and interesting panel uh, um, with us today. Uh, and through the magic of internet, uh, the fact that we are all under some sort of movement restriction because of the pandemic uh, has really kept us in our places. Uh, at least our minds are active and hard at work. And uh, this is a great opportunity to hear from uh, people working across many disciplines towards a common conversation about primates. Uh, so so with, I'd like to introduce our panel. Um, or should we wait for a few more people to come in? What does everyone think? Okay. Uh, so okay, let's let's meet our panel and starting with uh, someone who is the furthest away. I'm very pleased to mention um, to bring in Dr. Shamini Paramarsivam. Now, Dr. Shamini is a teaching fellow at the School of Veterinary Science at the University of Surrey. Uh, she is one of the founders of Animal Neighbors Project, which addresses the issues of human and wildlife interactions in many of our urban areas. So, welcome, Shamini. Hi, Hi, thank you. <laughs> thank you for coming and being up at this unearthly hour for you. It's really great to have you with us. Next, uh, across the pond uh, in Malaysian Borneo, we're really pleased to have with us uh, Dr. Felicity Oram. Right? Who are you in? Are you in Kinabatangan now, Felicity? Uh, no, no, I'm not. <laughs> the The uh, internet wouldn't be good enough there. But <laughs> okay, but are you in? All right, are you in the eastern I'm in part? KK. I'm are in you in KK? Yeah. Great. Okay, so uh, Dr. Felicity Oram is a conservation practitioner and a behavioral ecologist. Uh, one of the most impressive and recent things she's done is that she conducted the first comprehensive assessment of wild orangutan survivorship in the degraded forest of the Kinabatan Ampera Plain, together with Hutan, another NGO which has got an impressive record of research in this area. So welcome, Felicity. We're very excited to hear from you. All right. Thank you. So Thank you coming me. back to Penang, which is in some ways the unofficial hometown of primate research uh, through the person of Dr. Nadine Rupert. Uh, Dr. Nadine is the senior lecturer of the School of Biological Sciences in University of Science Malaysia. She is the head of the Primate Research and Conservation Lab uh, there, and also one of the co-founders of Malaysian Primatological Society, which is kind of like a, what do you call, incubator. <laughs> for future primatologists, right? Um, and uh, so she has, at the same time as running this empire, uh, starting to really train and build up uh, uh, primatologists, there are several research projects that she's currently involved in, and she will uh, share with us a specific study on pigtail macaques. Uh, and then uh, come to Jolene Yap, almost needs no introduction, right? Uh, Jolene is the founder of Lango Project Penang, uh, and, uh, you know, for, for uh, of course, in Penang, the Dusky Langors are the star. And uh, Lango Project Penang has helped to make this particular species and the study uh, a kind of a model for how citizen science can really make a breakthrough in how and t teaching us on how we can be involved in primate conservation. So welcome, Jolene. OK, so I saved the best for last. Um, it's Peter Ong, right? Uh, Peter Ong. Uh, who comes to us from the performing arts, right? Peter has a background in musical theater, uh, but is also an avid nature lover and a very good photographer. So Peter's going to start by giving us a, re a beautiful pictorial introduction to primate diversity in Malaysia. Uh, many people are actually surprised that we do have so many primates, right? And so I think this is the thing, uh, the habitat group, which comprises our discovery park on Penang Hill and the foundation are created to stimulate and support biodiversity conservation. Uh, Malaysia as a major migrant diversity country has a huge responsibility in, 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 in because of the privilege we have uh, in harboring so many rare species that are only found here. And I think that's something that we all really need to take to heart. If we can't achieve that here, Many species found here are also found nowhere else or are threatened in those parts of the world. Anyway, so uh, I'd like to uh, welcome Peter and his, he's going to, talk, going to talk to us about his journey uh, with Project Monet. Welcome, Peter. 
Right. Thank you very much, Justine. Thank you so much, Justine, and to the entire team at the Habitat Foundation for organizing this wonderful web forum. I am so privileged, and it's my honor to um, be here alongside such a distinguished panel as well. Um, so let me start with the first slide. Um, so over here, you see a siamang, and uh, I took this photo um, on the slopes of Genting Highlands um, as part of Project Moniet. Um, what is Project Moniet? Well, Essentially, it's a photography journey to photograph and discover more about the 25 species of primates here in Malaysia. And it culminated in, in an exhibition in KL uh, last year with Think City. Um, I managed to capture 14 of the 25. Um, it was a lot of hard work to do in a year, but um, let me take you back to how it all began. So um, if I can bring you to the next slide. So, um, People always ask me, like, you know, you're in the performing arts. What on earth are you doing trying to photograph um, monkeys? <laughs> Not even primates, monkeys. So I always tell them this, this story because this is what really happened. So um, I volunteer as well with Roots and Shoots Malaysia. And um, during one of Jane Goodall's, Dr. Jane Goodall's visit to Kuala Lumpur, yes, the preeminent uh, primatologist, Dr. Jane Goodall, um, she asked me a, a straightforward question into my face. She asked me, so Peter, how are Malaysia's primates doing? I was a bit stumped. I was like, hmm, I don't have the answer, but I can search for it in Google because, you know, we're so internet connected here in Malaysia. So I went on to Google and did a search. And lo and behold, there were no straight answers to be found. Um, it left me very perplexed. So I got in touch with Dr. Nadine and the Malaysian Primatological Society as well, who were extremely helpful. Um, in filling me in. And this really also inspired me to get answers on my own because if Google could not give me answers, then obviously I needed to go around and find it out for myself. So that is essentially what kicked off Project Monia. Um, which brings me to the next slide. Um, I found out along the way, you know, um, how many species we had in Malaysia and it really, it, uh, it's it's really a, an amazing fact that we have the second highest uh, number of primates in Asia. We have 25 species um, found in Malaysia, and that is an incredible record and something we, which we need as Malaysians to protect, I feel. Um, but along the way, of course, you know, I, the more I learned, the more I discovered that uh, we really need to step up. Um, out of the 25 species, two are critically endangered, 10 are endangered, all gibbons in Malaysia are endangered. Uh, nine species are considered vulnerable and three are data deficient. So in short, all apes, large and small, except for humans, are, are endangered in Malaysia. Um, and, it, and it really perplexed me because I was thinking, how can it be that in 2020, when we can find out so much about a stranger in the MRT seat sitting across us with Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, etc., we still have primates in our jungles, that we know close to nothing about. How can it be that we have primates uh, in our jungles that are data deficient or that we know so little about? Uh, you know, and Malaysia has one of the highest internet penetration rates in the world. We're always on the phone being busybodies. We even have a term in Malaysia called Makci Bawang, you know, because we're obviously naturally curious. Uh, like all primates, we're naturally curious, but why aren't there more answers regarding our primates in the wild? Um, so which brings me to the next slide. Um, to highlight our little known leaf monkeys. So this is a photo of the Robinson's banded langur, um, which I was fortunate enough to capture in Sigari State Park while uh, looking out for the southern pigtailed macaques, which is a testament to how rich our jungles are. You know, you go in looking for one thing and you come up getting a whole load of other things as well. Um, and it was only in 2019, last year, that a paper was published detailing how the Robinsoni, this presbytistus leaf monkey, the femoralis, and the pecura, which were all considered uh, subspecies of the banded langur, should now be regarded as a separate species and bringing the total presbytist species to a count of 19, which is incredible. I mean, there's still so much to be learned and to be discovered in our jungles. And, and I really hope that this, uh, is, is a sort this project Monet can be sort of a clarion call to the youth as well as to members of the public to go out and discover as well, discover more. Um, which brings me to the next slide um, with regards to our leaf monkey populations. Um, as you can see, um, we have the Robinson's banded langur, the Hose, Hose's langur, white fronted langur, so langur, silver langur. There are so 
Um, there's been very, very little studies done on them. And obviously there are a lot more questions than there, there are answers. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about um, uh, my, my um, search for these uh, primates. Um, it's been very, very hard for me to locate um, the last remaining 11. One of them is the Hoses Langer, which I'll tell you about as well. Um, but hopefully after this, this web forum, um, hopefully that will change in the near future as well. Um, which brings me to my next slide. Um, everyone's always asking me, you know, so what is it like photographing these primates? What was your journey like? What did you learn? Um, I really learned so much. Um, I can say I'm heavily indebted to Dr. Nadine for being such a font of, of knowledge and information. Um, I discovered so much more, not just about primates, but about our country, about Malaysia, and of course, meeting uh, inspiring people along the, along the way. Um, I learned so much about all the primatolo primatologists uh, in the forefront um, and everyone else uh, doing such incredible work um, that we really need to get behind and to champion. Um, I learned a lot about lowland jungles while uh, looking for um, the southern pixel macaque, <laughs> um, the macaca nemestrina. Um, I learned uh, in the lowland jungles exactly how difficult it is to photograph our primates. It's very unlike the African plains where everything is open, you know, you see lions in the distance, elephants on the horizon, it's all, you just sit there and you take the photograph and that's all cool. Um, but in our jungles, let me tell you, so you have like, you know, debris, branches, everything in the way. And of course, primates being primates, they're mostly largely arboreal, which means they're up in the trees, sometimes 20, 30 meters up. And then you've got the whole drama of the backlight as well, which um, I can tell you out of probably a thousand images, probably about five are usable. So that's been a real challenge. And it also, um, I also learned that what I really hate most about the jungle are our thorny rattan plants. Because when you're trying to maneuver in the jungle with a huge 600 millimeter fixed lens, other lenses in your backpack, water, tripod, the last thing you need are for these plants to you know, snag every bit of you and you know, just slow down your journey as you're trying to follow a primate and, it, and watch it disappear into the horizon, literally. Um, which brings me to my next slide. Um, what did I learn in the jungles of Borneo? Oh, that's amazing. Um, Borneo is, is simply, simply amazing. I've had the, the privilege to go through the Danung Valley, through Tabin, through the Kinabatangan, um, maroon langurs, proboscis monkeys, silverleaf monkeys, and of course, orangutans. Um, it's always a magical journey to encounter them in the wild. And I, I tell everyone I meet, I highly recommend it to everybody, especially for Malaysians. You know, there is a saying, tak kendal maka tak cinta. Uh, when you don't know, you 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 don't love. So I, I highly recommend everyone to just go out there and get this experience for yourself. It's it's in our own uh, backyard, so to speak. Um, looking for the Hoses Langer in Long Pasia, um, which was on my bucket list, um, was really really challenging. Long Pasia, and this is why I uh, I, I love uh, Project Moniat so much because it brought me to to the furthest reaches of our countries. You know, to a little village of Long Pasia. Um, eight hours away by car uh, from KK. Um, we were searching for the data deficient Hoses Langer. Um, no information, there was a sighting and a, and a photograph, but no real information about uh, what trees they feed on or even their, their uh, you know, uh, their, their paths or, or where they are. And uh, after about four days in the jungle, Unfortunately, um, we could not locate uh, a Hoses Langer, but we managed to find the East Bornean Gibbons instead, which was really, really lovely. Um, again, hilly terrain, morning mists, backlighting and craning your neck upwards. It's all a challenge to take a photo in our jungles, um, which brings me to the next slide. Um, the White Light Langer. Um, this one is a really funny story because I was in Fraser's Hill to look for this Langer. And when I spotted this langer, of course, there were other people as well because they're easily spotted in Fraser's Hill. So there were other members of the public with me. And I, of course, I brought out my big lens and everyone's like, what are you looking at? What are you looking at? And I said, oh, my God, there's a, that's a white light langer. And they were like, isn't that the same kind of monkey you see in Batu Caves? And I'm like, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's really interesting because then it really... Uh, uh, made me realize that we still have a long way to go in informing, 
in educating uh, uh, Malaysians about the diversity and the wealth of 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 our primates and how you know uh, the Batu Caves monkey and the orangutan are not just the only two primate species that we have in Malaysia. Um, I've also found a population of the white tight langur in uh, Bukit Kiara, and I've also heard that they they are in the Kota Damansara Community Forest, um, which means that they are actually doing well in urban areas in the green belt. So I you know, there's even more room for study um, on these amazing langurs. Uh, which brings me to my next slide um, about other things that I've learned along the way. Um, I've learned how similar we are beyond DNA. Um, uh, I've learned uh, about you know, the family structure of gibbons and watching, this was one of my highlights, watching Daddy Siamang literally up in the trees, um, form a bridge. He brought uh, two different branches together of the canopy together so that his little child could cross, you know, while mom and babe and younger child were off in the distance. But um, it, it was such an incredible sight to see um, and, and how important the role of the father is in the family unit, pretty much like humans, you know, um, which brings me to my next slide. Um, of course, um, as with all primates and many mammals as well, mother's love, mother's love is incredible to watch. Um, I was watching this pair, uh, this pair, um, mum and baby, long-tailed macaque. Um, I noticed that baby had an issue with his eye. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, a genetic uh, defect called correctopia, where the the, the pupil is is off center. Um, but mother was really exceptionally protective of, of this little one because obviously he he is visually impaired, um, couldn't really gauge um, distances between between branches to leap off from and, and mummy was always there to help guide him along the way which was really really beautiful to see um incidentally this uh their population has dropped from least concern to vulnerable in the latest iucn findings which should sound alarm bells everywhere we should never take a species for granted and this just shows that more research needs to be carried out um even with the long tilt macaques which you'll find out later on in this web web forum um and on to the next slide um Along the way, I've also encountered um, the ugly face of the illegal wildlife pet trade. Um, I've seen for myself uh, the baby langurs, the baby gibbons that are victims of this trade. Um, uh, if the video can be played for you for just a short while, just for you to see what it's like in rehab. Yeah. So a lot of um, baby gibbons um, in the trade get sent uh, well, if they survive and are lucky enough, um, get sent to places where they hopefully learn to survive again in the wild. These rehabilitation centers, we have uh, an orangutan rehab center as well in Sepilok and also one more in Sarawak. Um, of course, the rate of success of rehabilitation is still debatable. Um, not many are are able to be released back into the wild. So we really have to nip this in the bud uh, with regards to illegal wildlife pet trade. We've got to nip it in the source and Honey from Perhilitan will, is here and we'll discuss this later as well. Um, that, ladies and gentlemen, there's a huge demand for our primates as pets. Um, and again, I reiterate, you know, rescued gibbons and primates end up in rehab, sometimes so traumatized that they can never be released back into the wild again. Which brings me to my next slide. What can we do? Um, firstly, report all cases of wildlife sales to Perhilitan. Whatever pops up on your feed, your social media feed is where these uh, these people are most active selling our primates, um, baby gibbons, baby langers, uh, take snapshots, um, uh, share the word, um, be a voice for these primates where they can't speak. Um, another thing that you can do is support our NGOs. We have incredible NGOs. Um, championing our primates, the Malaysian Primates Logical Society, the Pongo Alliance, Langer Project Penang, and Animal Neighbors Project um, are here to tell you about the amazing work that they are doing. And of course, be an ally. Help these NGOs to raise funds. Volunteer with them. Never underestimate what you can do, even as uh, an individual. Speak out for them on your social media and in your circles. That is very, very helpful and goes a long way, especially in urban centers where we need to bring a lot more awareness to ask questions, find out the answers for yourself. And another thing, support local, well, responsible local ecotourism. Because this gives people an important 
economic incentive to preserve our forests and also our wildlife. Um, yeah, um, I think uh, those are the things which are really, really important and which need to be addressed. Um, and finally, um, uh, I want to show you a little video um, because you always remember your first time. Uh, that's one of my highs that I remember um, along the journey. Uh, my first time, the first time I, I saw a gibbon in the wild, first time um, I came across a proboscis in the wild. Um, I'm still hoping for a first time to come across a hoses langer in the wild, but this was the first time in Tabin that I came across this uh, rehabilitated and released female uh, and her little baby. So take a look. <laughs> yeah, I remember um, crouching down on the floor, belly on the floor, um, trying not to make a sound, trying not to move, just trying to capture a video of them interacting. And it was really magical. And that is something which which I wish more Malaysians could experience and be, be more aware of as well, that these magnificent creatures are ours to look after. And really, we need to rise to the occasion. Yes, and so after this, um, I would okay, like- Okay, I'm back on. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Um, that was really amazing. And um, it was there was a lot of heart and humanity in there. Um, I want to ask you a question about, uh, are you still on your mission though? You, you have a ways to go yet, yeah? I, am. I have 11 more species. Some of them are data deficient. Some of them have 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 studies done but very very little information on as well so if anyone out there can give me leads that would be really <laughs> useful <laughs> okay so, so, so um or why don't you just give us a clue like uh for, for peninsula malaysia name okay. three species that you you definitely need to do this year uh perhaps borneo as well so um i am going up to perlis to look for the stumptail macaque still looking for people who are know where they are. I've, I've gotten in touch with, with a few of them, but unfortunately during the MCO period, they've lost uh, track of, of, the, of the troops. So, um, of course, slow lorises. I've also been in touch with uh, Nadine and Priscilla from a uh, night spotting project. And hopefully I'll get to Sugari soon to, to look for them. I've been up to Fraser's Hill as well to look for the slow lorises, but unfortunately, again, you know, the, the, I, I, I reckon there are just so few of them left in the wild because they're also endangered, you know, I was talking to someone in Fraser Seal and he said, you know, they used to be so easily spotted. I was like, well, guess mm. not anymore. <laughs> I think one of the things which has been really great about Project Moniat is that you've been very giving and you've been letting uh, NGOs and conservationists use your pictures, right? Oh, yeah. yes, absolutely. Yeah, and, and I think that's so helpful because uh, it is really hard to communicate how precious they are if you don't have the images. And that's really fantastic. All right, we'll come back to you later. I know that there have been some questions for Peter, a lot of involving photography, how to do this, but we'll save that for the end. Uh, I'd now, like, now like to draw on uh, Felicity to come on and, and um, I, you know, we've been asking all these amazing people who could quite happily run a one hour lecture each on their topics as they're so good, but and we're asking you to do it in 10, 12 minutes, which is really inhuman and cruel. But the intention is to generate information for a forum to engage with our audience. So Felicity, without further ado, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And if we can bring my slides up, thank you, uh, Peter. Uh, and I know that the orangutan, how much uh, a compelling thing it is to see an orangutan for the first time. And you saw a rehabilitant in a wild setting. And that's a, an orangutan that lost her home when she was young and is now trying to return to the forest so that her next generation will be back in the wild again. But here um, I'm going to speak about uh, wild orangutans and here's a photograph of some wild orangutans uh, from Eastern Sabah. Um, and of course, orangutan means person of the forest. Next slide, please. Uh, okay, so what is an orangutan? Everybody thinks they know what an orangutan is, but um, uh, often in the work that I now do with Pongo Alliance, um, uh, I'm talking to people a lot and uh, there's a lot of misperceptions. So orangutans are not just big monkeys. 
uh, our, our orangutans are Asia's only great ape species, and apes are in the same taxonomic family as people. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and of course, uh, our, our people know that orangutan is critically endangered. They're fully protected, protected um, uh, worldwide. Um, and they're very uh, uh, iconic and emblematic. They live all over the world in zoos, but for the last 40,000 years or so, they live in the wild only on the islands of Borneo and Sumatra. So for Malaysia, that's in Sabah and Sarawak, and also in Indonesian Borneo and Sumatra. Next slide. So what do orangutans need? Orangutans are the largest tree living mammal and what in scientists we called habitually arboreal. It doesn't mean they don't um, walk on the ground. Um, uh, in the picture that Peter Ong showed earlier, we saw a rehabilitant actually sitting on the ground. You're not gonna see a wild orangutan do that, but they do walk on the ground sometimes. But they're so well adapted to the trees, even though they have hands and feet, they really have four hands. Um, and all their food comes from trees and lianas and other forest plants. They even sleep in trees. They build very comfortable spring mattresses, fresh each night in trees. So if you have no natural forest, you have no wild orangutans. Um, next slide, please. So um, orangutans require really rich and diverse uh, forests. And the, um, from our studies, um, uh, and my PhD work from University of Malaysia Sabah together with the NGO Hutan, we have shown that that the, in the degraded forest in Kinabatangan, they're doing quite well, but an orangutan cannot live on a monoculture of any plant. Uh, they really need the very rich, diverse forests that are found in lowland areas, along, usually along major rivers or in floodplains, which is the best habitat for orangutans. It's also very great habitat for oil palm. Next slide, yes. So if we have a model of a forest here and say uh, this is a, a, a forest along a river and say this is what the Kinabatangan might have looked like until about the 1980s. Next slide. If we did a population survey uh, of orangutans in, a, in a, a, a pristine forest, we'd see that they occur in low density, but they're widely dispersed. Orangutans are not like monkeys, they don't feed in groups, so we tend to see them quite spread out in the landscape. Next slide. Um, I've lost part of my slide. Uh, next slide. Oops, okay, I've lost, uh, back one slide, please. Okay, I've lost part of my slide, or it's, it's unfortunately, it's not showing very well. Anyways, genetic and behavioral study have shown that actually orangutans do have a, commu a community structure. And if you could see uh, my slide properly, um, you would see that orangutans live in clusters of related females. Uh, and um, yes, there we go, being demonstrated, thank you. Um, and uh, they live on the ancestral land and um, the female orangutans stay in the same place for life, but adult males move around and disperse and migrate throughout the, la the landscape. So they have, even though they're spread out across the landscape, they have a community structure. Next slide, please. So when, uh, so in the Kinabatangan region, like many places um, in the 1980s to about 2005, we had um, a, a really intensive period of land conversion where a, a forest was converted to oil palm agriculture and we lost about 80% of our orangutans. And, and that was preferentially, we lost females because females are much more tied to the land. Next slide. So um, in 2005 in the Kinabatangan, um, we, uh, some of the larger tracks were gazetted into the Lower Kinabatangan Wildlife Sanctuary, a very visionary move on the part of, of the Saba government to even though it was a fragmented habitat already, they, they went ahead and made it a sanctuary. And that's really key for the survival of orangutans in Kinabatangan. Um, next slide. So, and in the same region for, uh, since 1998, um, a study with, uh, in collaboration with Hutan, 
Um, and also in my PhD work at, from University of Malaysia Sabo, we found that orangutans are surviving very well in the protected forest fragments. Um, but overall, in the, Kin uh, the Kinabatangan population is still declining, but just at a bit lower rate. Um, but we know really, as of 2018, we, we knew very little about uh, their survival in the commercial landscape. Next slide. And so um, what became obvious from our study of the orangutans in the protected landscape is that orangutans are at a critical tipping point and that without the cooperation of the largest land administrators in the landscape today, and this, this slide shows our engagement area, and all the white is, is a commercial oil palm landscape and the green are, is protected forests, um, that we need uh, to, to preserve the community structure that needs to operate across the distance. So, so with Pongo Alliance, we began a new study in 2019 to not only study more about the orangutans in the privately held in, uh, landscape, but to also collaborate and try to build bridges um, with the oil palm growers to be active partners in orangutan conservation. And this work is uh, the, uh, um, the initiating funding, which is very visionary move on the part of, si of Yawasan Saim Darby, and also the French Alliance for the Preservation of Forests. Next slide. So in the first year of study of our work in Pongo Alliance, we have found that orangutans are, are, are doing their part to still maintain their community structure throughout the landscape. And in fact, um, to much to my surprise, I knew that I had a very good idea orangutans were out there in the private landscape, but I was quite surprised to find 89% um, of all of the small forest patches in the, in the oil palm landscape uh, are still used or lived in by orangutans in Kinabatangan. Um, so, so the orangutans is really a very good indication from this preliminary uh, part of the study that orangutans really are doing their part. Uh, so now it's up to us. Um, next slide, please. So what is it that the people need to do? We need to create a paradigm shift in both how we think about conservation and also agriculture thinking from exclusion of orangutans to inclusion in these across these mixed uh, landscapes. Um, and so we are doing this by engaging oil palm growers as active uh, participants to monitor orangutans uh, and to build evidence-based solutions together uh, so that we can build a coexistent landscape. And because if we do not do this, there's really no um, uh, the, the prospect of a long-term survival of orangutans in this habitat is uh, not good. And it wouldn't be because the landscape can't support them. It's because we need to do our part too to help uh, them. Uh, and the next example of uh, in this slide is um, uh, where we built a, a bridge across a, a small tributary that um, orangutans used to be able to cross, but they they couldn't cross now because the trees have been are not big enough anymore. Um, and that we did with a collaborating partner, uh, Sawi Kinabalu in the Kinabatangan. Next slide. So, and the, the real uh, core idea about uh, Pongo Alliance is that it's really a reciprocal capacity building so that we engage the um, oil palm industry uh, to communicate to us what they need. And we try to help to, to translate what the orangutans need and how we can find um, uh, solutions together. And this is um, challenging also because the wider landscape is is uh, got competing companies who are actually competitors for their product. So um, this is a, um, a very interesting challenge um, for for us. And, and I'm, we're very pleased that so many companies are leaning in. Next slide. An example of this is um, we, we uh, with we had a, a, a problem with one estate where the uh, workers were afraid um, uh, of working near a forest that we found out their orangutans are living in because they felt that they were sort of being looked at uh, by these animals. And of course, they're large animals and um, they had never experienced an orangutan before. They had fear. And so together we uh, showed that actually orangutans are not a net naturally aggressive species. They're as afraid of people as people are of them. 
Um, and we worked together to build a, 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 a poster that we could not only use on the estate where, where they had this problem, but, but that we could uh, bring to other estates that have similar problems. Uh, next slide. And so now uh, this uh, poster about what what you will see, what what to do when you see an, uh, an orangutan uh, has been installed in, si in sign uh, sign as sign boards near habitat patches. And so it's sort of an ongoing reinforcement. Um, and then I also, um, as a carry on from my PhD work at, at University of Malaysia Sabah, I now have a master's student who is looking at a uh, range size of females and uh, working together with the with the um, estates uh, and working actually in the estates to monitor orangutan use. Next slide, please. So uh, again, thank you for listening to the this short talk. We thank our sponsors and our collaborators uh, in NGOs and also the the government agencies here in Saba. Uh, so that together we can um, act responsibly to ensure a coexistent lam landscape for wild orangutans in one of the few places on earth where Asia's only great ape still lives. And what we uh, need to do is to, is to retain females in the places where they've adapted to live, that they've survived the land uh, conversion and are raising their babies in this, in this landscape. And we need to... Um, be sure to allow males to have free pass passage across the commercial oil palm landscape between the forest fragments where females live. Next slide. So then, so what can you do? And uh, say, we'll follow the lead of some very visionary oil palm growers and support pioneering um, uh, work to, to um, include rather than exclude wildlife from mixed use landscapes, which is really everywhere now, um, and uh, act wisely, but be more flexible in your thinking. Um, people didn't think orangutans could survive in these kind of environments, but we're finding they can. Um, have respect for your fellow primates for what they are. I mean, uh, primates are like orangutan, they're very cute, but they don't exist for human amusement or entertainment. We need to respect their dignity and find creative ways to share and, and spare and share space for them as wild, uh, fully realized uh, beings. And um, do not feed wild primates. Uh, uh, nothing good ever comes of feeding wild uh, primates, in my opinion. Uh, that's not a building a dependence, is not facilitating coexistence, because that natural distance that a wild animal maintains from people is very key to being able to get along together. You know, they say sometimes is, is uh, uh, keeping a good space is the way to get along. Um, and then uh, for, for all Malaysians to be proud of the tremendous diversity of primates that still live wild in Malaysia, there's only one other country in the world that has wild populations of orangutans, gibbons, siamangs, many species of monkeys, tarsiers and slow laris. So that's something to be proud of. And um, thank you. Thank you, Felicity. And I think that last part that you mentioned uh, about Bornean diversity uh, in the Kinabatangan, for example, right? We know that in primates alone, there are 10 species, if I recall, is that correct? In Kinabatangan, uh, 10 spe species of monkeys, yes. Oh, monkeys. Okay. No, 10 species no, of primates. <laughs> yeah, yeah. with the loris and tassias and everything. And um, yeah, that, that's something that we really need to remember. And the work, uh, which is of course focused on orangutans, definitely forest patches also harbor all these species as well. All right, so um, that's really game changing. I think uh, a lot of people, you know, people who don't know so much uh, have a notion that uh, primates and orangutans can only live in wilderness, right? This is a fixation of the global north even, and uh, all of this seems like it's too late. What would you say to someone who says that it's too late? Well, um, I have to say that if you're, uh, uh, I think as a conservation biologist, you, you have to be an optimist. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I have to say that in the past year, I really have been completely shocked, both by how many orangutans I found in the private landscape that are still surviving. And like I said, that are still trying to maintain their community structure. But I've been equally um, pleased uh, with the level of really visionary oil palm growers who who 
uh, don't un understand very much about these primates. Sometimes they see them, but how much uh, many are leaning forward to try to do the small amount of things. I mean, for some wildlife, we don't know enough about them to really know what they need. Um, or, or uh, and but with orangutans, especially in Kinabatanga, they're so well studied. We know what they need, but and they don't really need much. So uh, of the wildlife, we're we're kind of a good poster child, both in that there's a lot of politics, or the orangutan has a burden of being loved sometimes. But but really, I I have to say um, the idea that that industry and conservation cannot work together. Is 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 something that uh, I think is is a wrong idea because based on my past year, uh, we've had some tremendous. I mean, it's not everybody. Where this is a process. This is only the first year of a project, and and you know, change doesn't happen overnight. But uh, but I am quite impressed by my colleagues in the oil palm industry that I've met, um, and that that have uh, that I are working with. Uh, us as collaborators on this first initiating project. And I'm also very proud of the um, uh, support from uh, Yawasan Sam Darby to to uh, support the, in, the the initial stages. It looks amazing. I, I mean, we hope to continue to hear more from this project because it's pointing in some very positive and interesting directions. So we're going to move from Felicity to Dr. Nadine but still stay in oil palm plantations. Uh, we're now going to head on to Nadine. And uh, again, human altered landscapes, but uh, wildlife are still continuing to survive. Right. Thank you. Um, thank you, Justine. And thank you so much, Felicity, for your fantastic talk. I met Felicity first last year, and she told me about the orangutan in the, in the Kinapatanga and in the oil palm landscapes, and I was equally shocked, I guess, <laughs> because that's the common perception. We think that wildlife is um, doing really badly in monocultures. And honestly, many species, they have challenges. But what I'm uh, trying also to um, present today is that we can build more resilient landscapes, just as Felicity has told us, also by looking um, to other primate species. And like the macaques, for example, um, the main study species I'm working on, they might even give farmers or oil palm planters some benefits by foraging in plantations. So I'm going to present you my research on the Macaca Nemestrina project. Next slide, please. And the Macaca Nemestrina project is one of five projects that is uh, under the umbrella of the Malaysian Primatological Society. And as Justina said, I'm also a senior lecturer at University Science Malaysia. So it's all about research, it's about conservation, it's about people and bringing people together to work on primate related issues. So for Makaka Nemestrina, please um, check out our website, it needs to be updated, but also um, follow us on Facebook. And we are studying the general behavior, ecology, and <clears throat> also working conservation about these um, Makaka Nemestrina or Southern Pictor macaques. This picture on the right is a fantastic photo taken by Peter while he was um, at my study site. So thank you for that. I just love it. So I'm going to present you about the role of these uh, macaques in oil palm plantations and question mark whether or not we can together work towards more sustainable palm oil or greener practices in palm oil uh, or oil palm agriculture. Next slide, please. So the presentation, short uh, presentation I'm going to give you um, was prepared by my PhD student, Anna. And uh, we have published the results in uh, current biology last year. So for anybody who's interested to go more into depth into the analysis or statistics, please contact me afterwards. So is there a way how we can actually make these oil palm monocultures more resilient or more diverse, especially for wildlife? So we have heard from um, Felicity that also in the Kinabatangan, but it's a problem as well in Peninsular Malaysia that when you convert natural forests into monocultures, there will always be negative effects on wildlife or biodiversity in general, plants. You lose species at a massive scale. So Malaysia has been losing parts of its primary forest to oil palm monoculture since um, probably even before the 80s, since the 60s. And this has led to reduced biodiversity, both plants and wildlife, impaired climate regulation functions, lower ecological resilience in general. 
Now, in these monocultures, we always have problem with pest species, either be it insect pests, but for oil palm, one of the major crop pests is actually um, are rats or rodents. And they have been known to cause major losses, yield losses for up to 10%. Now, another thing is now when we try to tackle these rodent pests, um, many planters are using red poison or what is called rodenticides. And it's also known that they are widely inefficient. They're quite expensive, so there's some uh, bioeconomic implications for that. And as for conservation, they are also harmful to the environment, not only by causing uh, runoffs into the, the groundwater or streams, but also because they target uh, or they harm non-target species, like for example, um, barn owls or leopard cats who might feed on rats naturally. Next slide, please. So generally, and Felicity has also pointed that out, Malaysia has been committed to um, induce greener practices. We have also a scheme which is called the Malaysian Sustainable Palm Oil uh, Certification Scheme. There is efforts to try to make the whole oil palm industry more not only uh, environmentally friendly, but also from a socioeconomic perspective. But just one of these aspects is by um, trying to introduce or use environmentally friendly or biological pest control agents instead of using poison. So widely used in many uh, sustainable plantations in Malaysia, or I think even in Indonesia, <clears throat> are barn owls. And barn owls, um, they are active at night. They, they glide over the uh, plantation ground and they, they predate on rats that are running across the oil palm uh, plantation ground. And on the left, you see the study population of my pigtail macaques. So this is what I'm coming to next, please. So just to give you a very short overview, I think Peter had mentioned Makaka Nemestrina um, is also recently has been updated from um, being vulnerable in the IUCN red list to becoming endangered. Again, as for macaques, this is it's shocking. I mean, I'm still trying to understand what the implications are for uh, this assessment, not only how we can now act to better conserve them, but also in terms of policies and, and research. So they have been upgraded because of habitat loss generally, um, also because of hunting or killing or culling. Some of that feeding from the perception of crop pests and their population trends are further increasing. But what we see is macaques use oil palm plantations in search um, of food. So it's a good foraging ground. This is why people who are working in plantations or who have a plantation, especially small holders who need to live off that land, are often very negative towards macaques when they see them in their plantation because they perceive them as crop pests. But we saw in our study that pigtails they actually forage actively for rats, not just opportunistically, but they go into the oil palm plantation every day for at least two hours and they search for rats. And we found through some study and calculations that I'm going to show you very briefly in the next slides that they are actively reducing rat numbers. So the study aim was to investigate the role of macaques, not only as crop pests, so how much damage do they, do they really cause, but also as biological pest control agents by reducing red numbers. And so that was done to assess their role. This is the study site, and Peter has mentioned about it. This is near Lumut in Perak. It's called the Sigari Melintan Forest Reserve. Unfortunately, Peter, it's not yet a state park. So I'm working with NGOs and trying to get it listed as a state park, but of course, that's a lengthy process. And on the right, you see um, the plantation area, the forest, and in pink and orange overlapping home ranges of two macaques or two macaques study groups uh, that we are following almost every day. They are habituated. They are not shy to um, us, to the researchers. So they allow us to take really good data. And inside the plantation, we put up trapping plots where we put uh, live traps for rats and assess population uh, abundance and um, the densities inside these oil palm plantations in order to find out whether or not macaques reduce rat numbers in the areas where the macaques are foraging. Next slide. So what we found is that one group of pigtail macaques annually, so each year, would consume about 12 tons 
of oil pump food. Now that's a lot, it seems. In the beginning, we're like, wow, okay, 12 tons. How, how do we go about this? But when you actually cut it down to um, the, the area that they're foraging in and how much oil palm fruit um, this area is producing every year, we had an annual impact factor of only 0.56%. And this is, um, this is the vast difference to 10% damaged by the rats. Next slide, please. So the consumption is of rats, yeah, no, sorry. So before that was the oil palm. Now how many rats they consume is more than 3,000 rats per year per macaque group. And coming back to the barn owls. So barn owls, as I said, they would fly over the ground at night and they would ambush on um, the rats that are running over the ground. Now the difference to barn owls, and this is why these two species, macaques and barn owls, can perfectly complement each other, is because macaques, they tear off the bark or what we call boots uh, of leaves on oil palm trees and they really try to chase out those rats from the tree during the day and would catch rats on the tree. So they get the rats that the barn owls don't get and 90% of their rats are caught under these boots or under the chopped off uh, leaf, tri uh, leaf um, bases from those um, oil palm trunks. Next slide. Okay, so statistics quite shortly, I'm not going to go into detail. What we found basically is in these areas where macaques forage regularly and on an average every fourth day, so an increase in 25% of presence of macaques would lead to 80% reduction of red numbers in these oil pump um, areas. Next slide, please. And if you cut this all down shortly, as I said, they cause losses of 0.5% of crop yield, um, whereas the rats cause losses of 10%, but their regular plantation visits reduce rat numbers by almost 80%. So when you convert that into a monetary value, what they actually do is they would increase yield by 7% in that area where they are foraging, and that is equal to more than 100 US dollar per hectare per year. So that's quite a number. Next week. So what does that mean? What's the implication for conservation? And now also coming back to Felicity's talk, how can we create incentives for planters, for oil palm companies, to leave wildlife in their plantations, be it the orangutan or here in this case, be it macaques? It's now that we can have this argument saying, look, if you allow macaques to forage in plantations, you might save a lot of costs, not only on rodenticides, but also because they facilitate um, yield increase. And how do you do that? You need to let them be able to come into your plantations. And you can only do this if there's intact forest in and around this um, oil palm landscape. So we need to have uh, wildlife corridors. We need to have forest buffer zones. We need to have a very interspersed matrix that not only allow macaques or orangutan, but also other wildlife like elephants or um, leopards, whatever you can think of, to, to cross these landscapes and to come in and some of them will be beneficial to the planters. So what we are trying to do now is engage with the companies. Um, so we are also having one uh, collaboration with Sime Darby already, but I'm also trying to get more um, planters, smallholders, but also big producers on board because we want to provide a win-win situation where we argue for wildlife being beneficial to oil palm planters. Next slide, please. Okay, so there's not everything is great about this, unfortunately, because some practices are still um, harmful to the environment. And now we are talking not only about the red poison, but also about other pesticides, like for example, herbicides that are used regularly in plantation management. And the outlook for this project is to assess how plantation man management practices might affect health or fitness, long-term fitness of our study population, because unfortunately what we see is some of them are infertile, <clears throat> some of them become skinny very, very quickly and de their health deteriorates. And one very distinct phenomenon, which is called facial dysplasia, 
has been connected to herbicide use in African studies. And you see in these pictures that some of our macaques also have some issues in their face. Some don't have an eye or have lost a nose. That can be due, due to fighting as well, but we have uh, macaques who were born with holes in their nose. So that's one aspect. How does herbicide use affect um, macaque health? And in terms of health and fitness, there's another study that we are starting or we have started last year. And it was interrupted now because of the MCO. So hopefully we can get back on track, which is um, a comparison between urban macaques, southern picture macaques in um, Lumut Mangrove Park, who are provisioned by the public who always feed them. And every day, at least 100 people would go there and feed these macaques. And these are the challenges that Chamini and the Animal Neighbors Project are facing, but they are not just in Kuala Lumpur, Slango, they are basically all over the peninsula where people think that feeding wildlife is something helpful, positive, maybe even giving you blessings, but in fact, you just harm um, wild animals and especially primates. So one project um, together with Kwasa, the local NGO and the Manjung City Council will address these issues. Next slide, please. But there are several other projects under the Malaysian Primatological Society. So I welcome everybody to join in. Please take a picture and sign up um, on our Facebook and also just send us a private message if you want to become a member. We are a registered NGO. There are opportunities for volunteering, for taking part in our research. We have five projects. So one is the Lengo Project Penang, which um, Jolene will talk more about in a moment. And then we have a, a short study on orangutans as well, which is called Primate Watch, where we used drones and technology to assess uh, population structure. Then um, we have the night spotting project currently operating in Langkawi, where um, the, the participants assess diversity and abundance of nocturnal mammals. And we have a study on small apes, or um, it's called Unka, and it is addressing the gibbons and siamang. And the next slide, please is also currently working with Pehilitan and also the IUCN on a national given action plan. So this sounds as important as it is, because as Peter has said, it is just shocking and sad that we have so little information about one or many of the most charismatic animal species in Malaysia. So small apes or gibbons uh, all endangered in the IUCN Red List, but there hasn't been any assessment since the 1980s. So we don't know a lot about them. And so currently my team and I and Dr. Susan Lapan, who's also here in the chat, we have partnered with the IUCN and we welcome everybody who has information about gibbons. So if you are a hobbyist, if you are a birder, if you know there's gibbons in your area, uh, please drop us a message. We need every piece of information that we can get about their distribution in Peninsula Malaysia, but also in Borneo. And uh, we also will have a workshop or public uh, webinar on, on small apes coming up soon in line with this IUCN workshop. So there will be more about gibbons very soon. Um, next slide, please. And just shortly for the uh, MPS, Primate, um, Malaysian Primate Logical Society, we have also won um, the bid for the, not the next, but the next, next conference on um, primates, which is held by the International Primatological Society to be conducted in Kuching in Sarawak in 2023. So currently, because of the pandemic, actually it was host, it was scheduled to be in 2022, but we hope that now the, the global situation may allow us to actually have that Congress in 2023. So that's the most important international uh, conference on primatological research and conservation in the world. So anybody who's interested, again, please, um, you will be notified in time, but follow our Facebook. Uh, next, please. And yeah, and that's it. So I'm, I'm entirely thankful for the funding and every kind of uh, assistance and, and help that was given to me throughout these years. So I'm, I'm not thanking everyone personally here, but I would like to thank Pehilitan and also the um, Peninsula Malaysia Forestry Department for permits, and especially, especially to all my students 
who did like a fantastic job in all these projects, all the members of MPS and especially the volunteers who throughout the seven years while we are doing the Macaca Nemestrina project have spent their time and money and sweat and blood and tears following macaques in the forest, going through the ratans, uh, fighting leeches and uh, sometimes poachers. And I, I'm really, really grateful to all of you. So again, if anybody's interested to join, uh, just drop us a message. And uh, we are really happy to, to welcome everyone on board for primate studies and conservation. Thank you. So I think Justine should come up. <laughs> Here she is. Oh no, Shamini. Hi, Shamini. <laughs> Oops, I'm muted. Oh, Justine's computer has some problems. So I guess I'm facilitating the transition to our next speaker. So as I said before, um, working with primates in generally, but not only in fragmented landscapes in terms of agriculture, but especially in urban environments, is a challenge not only to MPS, but to another fantastic project that has been sprouting, uh, which is called the Animal Neighbors Project. So Dr. Shamini, who's currently based in the UK and coming to us at this unholy time of what is it, 5 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> we have five now. I've I finally woken up. <laughs> is going to introduce the work with urban macaques who are obviously often similarly negatively perceived by the public. So I guess all these challenges, we all face them commonly. Uh, oh, Justine is back. Maybe she I'm back. I'm back. My computer crashed. It happened. All right. Never mind. You guys are pros. All right. So we should we go into Shamini before we answer questions? Um, Okay, I, there is one question from, um, oh, I think let's, let's start, uh, there was a question about, uh, perhaps I, well, hang on, let me, let me, I need to go and find it, just a minute, All right, but, um, yeah, here we are, specifically on the rats. Okay. Um, Nadine, is the rat consumption behavior of Macaca nemestrina restricted to your study population only? So is it uh, restricted to this population or the populations found associated with oil palm plantations or small holdings? So yeah, there it is. Uh, yeah, because I think, um, I, I'm sure so one of the things that you would like to do is actually test this out in other sites, right? Perhaps you want to speak to that because this is my, also about your plans moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. And um, that for. that's a great question because the, the issue that we face is that we really just have that small focus on our study group in our study site because it's incredibly difficult to habituate um, pig time macaques. So that took us many years to get this kind of quality data. Now, we don't know, but I don't believe that this is just that one population in that one study area because if there is any forest that has adjacent oil palm plantations that allows access to macaques, um, I would 100% expect those macaques to also forage for rodents or mammals in these plantations because they do not only feed on fruit. Even in the forest, we see them feeding on small mammals, even the giant squirrels, who are really giant. So they they are they are known to be frugivores. They eat a lot of fruits and we are also trying to understand the relationship between abundance of food in the forest and the consumption of um, not only the reds but also oil palm fruits whether there's correlation so this will take a little bit more of time until we find this out because it's seasonally so we cannot do this in like a year but i would expect them to do this generally in any area where they are allowed to access oil palm plantations and as in any wildlife, I see the question here on screen, there's also a reference to whether this can pose any more um, uh, uh, zoonotic diseases, as for example, now with COVID-19 or, I mean, as I think just Shamini will also address this question as any interface between humans and non-human primates, if we are exposed, we get too close to each other, there's always a risk of getting any of these zoonotic diseases, maybe hepatitis or herpes or COVID. Now, 
there's a risk. This is why you should always keep your distance, not feed wild animals. And as for allowing them to be part of the oil palm plantation management or landscape, if you just let them do their thing, and naturally they are very shy, plantation workers hopefully wouldn't even get too much in touch with them, then I don't see that there's any increased risk of exposure to any disease. All right. Okay, quick question. Um, pigtail macaques are often not really um, considered the most lovable of the primates, but you've gotten to know them. How many years have you been with this group that you've habituated? Uh, it's About the seven yeah, yeah, it's the seventh year. So that's the thing. So you saw the first picture of Peter Ong. Yes. It's just yes. very cute. If mm. people who are not familiar with how they react in the wild, just see them in urban areas and parks where they are fed or come in touch with them. Um, for example, released ex pet monkeys who are naturally more aggressive. They always have this perception that pigtail macaques are very, very bossy, very you know, like very aggressive, aggressive but yeah. it took us so long to, to habituate them just because naturally they're very, 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 very shy. And they're very silent. They get lost immediately in the forest. If they don't want to be seen, they just merge. Yeah, they camouflage very well with the undergrowth. And sometimes mm. you hear this distinct who, who sound and oh, they're there. Let's follow them. So it's, it's <laughs> All right. how, how elusive they actually are and how shy and how pleasant it is to follow the wild macaques, not the ones that people have. Mm. They have messed up with the character and the behavior. If you start feeding them, it's completely different. Right. Okay. Um, there are so many excellent questions about uh, for Felicity and you, but let's now we have to move towards the urban landscape. And so we're going to call Dr. Shamini again. Um, so, uh, Shamini, you get to work with the other macaque species, right? Yeah. Who, uh, I mean, officially, previously, were known as the species of least concern, but more like species that people couldn't care less about, right? I mean, uh, but now we're finding that they've been reclassified as vulnerable. Uh, this is kind of like people can't seem to make this connection that like what's actually happening. There seem to be so many of these creatures and exactly. they're making a nuisance of themselves. So yeah. you've taken it upon yourself to do the very difficult uphill battle of trying to ease this uh, human wildlife interaction. So, yeah, we're very keen to hear your story. Thank right. you. Thank you, Justine. That's actually a really good introduction um, because when, whenever we say we're working with um, um, macaques or we're working with primates people say oh very interested and then when we say oh we're working with macaques people tend to say oh really why why not an orangutan or something else so it's really nice to be given this opportunity to talk about macaques um, uh, in a space that that really appreciates these animals but and again of course i'm going to focus on the urban uh, setting with the the long tail macaques but you'll see pictures of other type of um, uh, uh, monkeys as well in my presentation next slide please so the uh, long-tailed macaque is a very beautiful and highly intelligent uh, primate species that are found distributed across Malaysia. Now they live in large groups, as you've probably already seen, um, and they are mostly they mostly consist of females. They, the females are the ones. So if you look at the picture on the, the left uh, corner, you, the ones with the white beard, uh, and they are the, the females and juveniles as well, which are very curious. So these are the ones that you might see com coming up to you if you are visiting a, a tourist site that has uh, macaques uh, uh, in it. They are, sadly, as pointed out before, they were at the least concerned status by the IUCN and now have moved to vulnerable uh, this year because of the current status and situation of how their population is slowly declining. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Next slide, please. So if you have come across macaques in um, an urban setting, as we said, you probably think, nah, they're doing really well. They are thriving in this urban setting and they are, you know, in, in large numbers. But it's actually not the case. So in reality, their, their natural habitat is reducing and has been reducing um, uh, for quite a long time, actually. And the, the thing about the macaques is that they have adapted very well to adapted well, I wouldn't say very well actually, to this urban setting. And because they're a group that travels quite a lot, you tend to see them move in, in different spaces as well. So it, it can be 
quite misleading that you think they, they exist in, in large numbers. That's one. Secondly, they also exist as a family. They exist in, in large numbers. So sometimes it is to their disadvantage that people think they exist uh, in, in large numbers. There's one thing that also keeps them coming back to the urban setting, which is this attraction to food. Um, and, and I'll talk about it in the, in the, the next slide. But I just wanted to also point out as well, to something to, for us to take into consideration, the more that we are creating a green residential area or a green urban um, uh, setting, which is great, but also be aware, be aware that this then makes them feel that it's more an opportunity for them to um, have to adapt to this, this habitat. So we've got to think about the space sharing that we uh, have with, with macaques as well as other uh, species. Next slide, please. So much like the food culture of us Malaysians, we have also developed a feeding culture with the macaques, as pointed out by uh, Dr. Nadine previously. Uh, this could be directly feeding. So in pictures at the bottom right-hand corner, you see this direct feeding of um, uh, macaques, which can either be purely for entertainment purpose. It can be with the, the uh, right intention. So a lot of people that come up to us say, oh, you know, these macaques have no food at all. Um, they aren't big fruit trees in this urban setting. Um, and so I spend a lot of my money feeding these animals on a day-to-day -day basis. Or it can just be from a tourism perspective. That's the direct way of feeding. The indirect way of feeding is, some, is via um, our food that's left accessible for them. So as you can see with the bins um, uh, accessible to these macaques, they get some of our human food. And also to think about the fruit trees. So fruit trees that we have are fruits with very high energy, high amount of sugar. Um, and it's very different from what they, uh, they actually consume in the wild. So macaques as a whole, they, they spend a lot of time foraging for food. As, as you can tell from the previous presentation, they spend a lot of time looking for food and actively um, searching these out and actually trying you know, to open things up. And we use the word forage more than feed because they, they're actively engaging in the feeding process. However, when they're, when they're feeding from, from food that people provide, it's a very quick um, activity of just taking the food and consuming it straight. And the other issue is, of course, the energy. So the, much of the food that we consume is very high in energy, whereas the natural diet of a, of a macaque is actually very low in energy. So research analysis by a previous study has shown that the natural diet of macaques is mainly, um, uh, um, con the content of it is mainly fiber based, it's a large percentage, and then also of uh, protein. Um, obviously, when they, are feed, when they get access to things like the potato chips, as the, the picture above, or the Ribena bottle or the picture below, um, that's very high in sugar. So with the human food, they end up having a lot of high sugar and, and high um, carbs. I've got a, a little diagram just showing some of the examples of what the natural diet of a macaque um, actually looks like. And they can actually get this in an, in an urban setting. So it's things like shrub, very low energy, little small uh, uh, fruits, and lots of, of um, uh, insects, so, uh, as you can see in, in the picture there. So it, it's a misconception that they are uh, starving they can actually do quite well with uh, what's readily available. Next slide, please. Feeding is also part of this interaction that we have with um, uh, macaques, especially from a tourism perspective. So anyone who does not appreciate the macaque because they, hasn't, they haven't seen it before, so mostly foreign tourists, when they come in here, would like to engage with, with this animal. And one of the ways is feeding, of course, because the minute you throw food out, they, they come to you, or if you hold some um, some uh, fruit or um, a tasty snack out for them, they come to you and that's a really good opportunity to get a photo uh, taken. So we see that a lot um, in, in a lot of these tourist sites. And I also, I put this picture up on the right hand side. I know it's not macaques, um, but I just wanted to highlight some uh, sometimes in some situation, the lack of understanding of how having this close interaction with uh, any wild animal is never something to be taken lightly. So to have children, especially around um, macaques or any uh, primate, is not a, a good idea and should obviously be discouraged. So we should learn to have an, a good distance when interacting with them. Now, the problem with feeding them in this situation, it causes, it develops a behavior learning that people are associated with food. So whenever they see people, they would move towards us. Next slide, please. This has become quite a problem because these are reports that have been taken by Perhilitan. 
And every year, they have a large number of complaints by, that, that are, are made to Burley Tan. So in 2018, the latest report shows that 4,850 reports were made within a year. That's an average of 400 complaints received by Burley Tan. And this is an, up, up, uh, an increasing trend. In 2015, it was 3,700. So this is quite a burden for them to take on as well. And most of these um, complaints expect immediate action to be taken to solve the problem for them. And that's not very, very realistic. Next slide, please. So that's where we, um, um, actually before I go on to, to speak about what we, can, we wanted to do, um, the current strategies taken on by uh, Pareli Tan did many different strategies, but kind of, sort of the two main ones, uh, translocation and culling of uh, macaque species. Now, when translocating, it sounds really nice. You take these animals from an urban setting and then you go and drop them off in a very uh, natural setting. However, it doesn't work as well as that. You've got to always think about where these animals are being dropped off, you know, if, if that is a viable um, location for them. If you drop them off there, are they just going to uh, move into a different space and create another problem? If there's already a, a population there, is that going to create more, more um problems as well. So think about things like the location, the population, the feasibility of this as a long-term solution and the sustainability of doing this. You know, can you send five staff members to just pick up two animals, move them from Selangor all the way to uh, Pahang? Is that actually realistic or not? And as I pointed out, the ecosystem impact, which is something greatly needing to be looked into in terms of translocation. So the kind of um, option that is, is used is the culling. And Malaysia has come under quite heavy fire, especially from 2013, when 100,000 macaques were reported culled on a yearly basis. And the last stats show about 53,000. So we're losing macaques in large numbers to this management strategy. So it's not very realistic because, as you can see, they're already dropping in terms of, of their, their population and status um, needs to be placed on, on, on conserving them. This is where the project comes in and we decided that we need to start looking into how we can uh, gauge this. Um, one of the things we started to do is to look at this relationship between human and, and macaques. And we, we studied the, the relationship by looking at people and, and monkeys and what the interaction was. We found that um, a lot of the initial, uh, react, initial um, initiated behavior was actually started off by people. So you can see a large um, green on the left-hand side, which is showing people engaging with curiosity towards the monkeys, as well as aggression. And uh, next point. Uh, so those were the main drivers. Next point, please. And when we delved into that a little bit more, looked into the tourist behavior, and there'll be a picture that follows soon, that this behavior of um, coming close to animals, uh, the macaques trying to get pictures with them, putting your hand out, offering them food, all of this was, was shown to, to be significantly affecting and causing the, the animals to then react in a very aggressive manner, as well as in a very fearful manner. And the last point is really to show that this is quite um, an obvious one, that human aggression was closely related to um, the monkeys showing actually very fearful behavior. So a lot of people say that they're very, very hardy, they, you know, they're very aggressive. But actually what we found was that it was people sort of scaring them and, and being aggressive towards them. And they, they were then very, very fearful. Next slide, please. The next thing we looked at is obviously uh, provisioning. So the feeding behavior seen in many of these tourist sites. And the three main points that I really want to talk about. One is that there was an, there was an presence of aggressive behavior when provisioning was happened. So aggressive behavior seen within the group were only seen during provisioning when people were actually feeding them. That was the first uh, important point. The second and important point, um, we can just move on with the points. Yeah, as you come on, thank you. The second important point is really this idea of what we uh, was classified as pest behavior. And I use this in inverted commas because this is what we perceive as pe pest behaviors. The macaques don't think this is pest behaviors. They don't do this intentionally. So things like raiding of bins or damaging of properties that cause a, a lot of uh, monetary loss to people. Um, this was seen predominantly when feeding took place and when feeding did, was very low or uh, when feeding was absent, then that was much, much uh, less uh, in number. And the last point was really when people weren't feeding uh, the macaques, they actually actively avoided people. So as long as you're not feeding them, they will tend to move away from people and, and find their, their own food. But the minute you start to feed them, then that, that statistic changes. Next slide, please. 
The other thing we looked at is also engaging with the community and did this multi-stakeholder workshops to get the community together to tell us what were the, were the problems. So this was really, um, we call them local action groups. So we got residents together, we got other stakeholders, we got Prohilitan um, in the, the local council and set everyone together and say, you know, let's let's think about what's the main problems that, that exist in this uh, different area. So we had eight sites that we worked in, in Slango and they identified problems within each area as well as identifying um, how this could have been tackled and which ones to prioritize. So, you know, we can't do everything at the same time and then thinking about resources as well. So this were done by the, the research assistants that did a fantastic job with this uh, workshop. Next slide, please. One of the main outcomes from the, this workshop was this issue about garbage bins and how macaques, you know, raid bins, they're pests, they create a mess, and there's a lot of um, hygiene issues as well. And this is a picture taken in uh, the UKM hall of uh, halls of residence where monk, uh, the macaques were always in the bins and the students were always too afraid to, to throw their rubbish. Um, and one easy solution that we came up with, well, it wasn't that easy because you have to actually design a macaque-proof latch, was a latch that could be opened by people quite easily, but could not be actually manipulated by, by the macaques. And you can see the stark difference between the two pictures. This is where we create a different perception. So sometimes I think we have to start adapting to changes. If you live among macaques or any kind of wild animal, you've got to also change the way that you are living uh, with them. Next, please. Then we took that a step further. So this a picture on the top left-hand corner is Bukit Gassing in PJ. Um, and the latch was put on all the bins in the area because the macaques would come from the forest and get in, um, into those bins. Now, this is really, this looks very nice, obviously, and we were very proud of this. But what I also want to highlight is to think about this in a very holistic. So um, the previous speaker spoke a lot about research. And this is where we want to do more research because by the macaques maybe not coming to this area, have they moved into the next area? And what's the impact of, of this implementation? And this is where research comes in. Little things like the, the bins um, in the middle, the two pictures are in Bukit Jalil, um, a, a type of bin where easy for people to throw their rubbish, but of course easy to make it for macaques to get in. So we, we just created a little bit of a flap that makes it a little bit more difficult for them to push, but people can definitely push back on, on that. And things like sometimes just having to close an area. So the picture with the man sort of looking like he's in prison, that's actually a, a, um, one of the locals trying to uh, barricade an area in the halls of residence to stop the macaques from coming in because the students were actually really fearful that the macaques were coming into their room. And sometimes realistically, we have to um, translocate some individuals. So the picture on the far up, uh, right hand corner is a uh, pigtail macaque that was seen in um, Bukit Gassin in PJ. And it was just a mum and the baby. And we suspect that this was a, uh, a macaque that maybe was released as an expat because she was really trying to get into homes and not letting people come out. So there was a huge fear factor and obviously pigtails, you know, much bigger. So these, uh, th this individual and her baby were translocated. And this was a little bit more feasible because it's one individual that was moved into a, a, a space. The, we also actively are trying to create an awareness and change the perception or, and, hum and change the, the, the human behavior um, by educating the, the young generation. So a lot of education material is available on our website, the Animal Neighbors Project um, org. Um, and, and these are resources that can be used by teachers or parents if you want to just create an awareness. We're also, we also have a chapter in the UK where we, we engage with um, students as well as the public to teach about responsible tourism. So hopefully changing the mindset of tourists before they come to countries um, in, in Asia where they're going to come across macaques and try and make that, that um, idea of responsible tourism more apparent. Next, please. So yeah, going back to community empowerment, I think that's really, really important. So sometimes I believe it's not, it's not just telling people don't do something, it's telling them the reason why. So we've created the signboards um, that are up around in a couple of the local action groups around Slango. So if you're around any of these areas and you've seen one, it'd be great for you to, to take a picture, let us know what you think about it. Um, but there's also a further explanation as to why, so that, that picture in the middle shows that relationship of why is it some a simple act of feeding can actually make it make the whole situation worse for the macaques and uh, cause them to reduce in number. I also just highlight this uh, report of conflict, um, not a word I like to use, but you know, just for, for the purpose of the website. 
um, we have this report of conflict. This is not the same as the what Prohilitan reporting uh, line is like. This is really for research purpose, for us to further our research to understand where exactly the problems are uh, occurring and what kind of problems. So if you encounter um, a, a macaque in a uh, urban setting around Selangor or anywhere else really, you can always put this in here. We, there's no immediate action, but it really helps with the research that uh, we're doing further on. Next, please. And just to highlight some of the future work that we're doing. So obviously, we as well are one of the projects and in our infant stage, there's a lot more for us to do. We really want to study the further uh, impacts of this implementation as well as more mitigation strategies that can work. I'm also really um, curious and really keen about this motivation and how we can keep macaques away in a very humane way um, by using motivations to, to alter the, the movement. And to think about a positive wildlife interaction in terms of tourism, we can't avoid people from seeing macaques because that's the whole point of tourism, but we need to think about what's positive in terms of um, engagement. So a lot more collaboration and research opportunities to, to look forward to. And the final slide. So I just want to thank everyone who has helped us along the way. We've had a lot of support, um, a lot of, of volunteers and the ANP team that, that consists mostly of uh, volunteers as well, to the research assistant, um, Hendra, um, especially, and Umu, as well as our collaborators, you know, from Pohelitan and um, UP, UPM, and the, um, the support from the University of Surrey, as well as the funding. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Sh thank you, Shamini, for that. Um, I'm sure so many people relate to the scenes and things that you've shown. Um, we've got a couple of questions in our chat, and uh, these come uh, are going to be pulled up on screen. Uh, but Sabrina Jabba asks, uh, with the preventatives in place to prevent macaques from having access to the bins, do all the residents actively close the bins and secure the latches? I mean, do the humans do what they're trained to do? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, not exactly, not always, and that seems to be a problem. But having this local action group seems to be quite good because in a way, they sort of self-regulate. Um, so if you've got a certain individual that is not doing it, um, because the rest of them are now going to suffer from that, I think they actively try and engage. But you're right, that is, is one of the problems. And that's why it's not as easy to create a latch because you've got to think of it. It's difficult for the macaques to open, but you've got to make it easy for people. There were many designs. Um, Hendra went through many designs of, of these latches because every time we had to test and say, no, nobody's going to use two hands to close this latch if they're holding garbage on one hand. So it's really yeah. kind of... Thing. So the, the project, actually, while we work with, with animals, we are really... Um, it's a lot to do with human behavior as, as well. So we would mm -hmm. actively engage with anyone who is keen on human behavior to uh, uh, send us a message and get in touch. Right. Okay, the other question is from Bernard Harrison. Uh, why do you think long-tail macaques are so good at interacting with or explo exploiting man for food compared to the other species that on the on city fringes? Yeah. Uh, yeah, good, another good question. I, I don't think um, they are good at exploiting. I think they, they are a lot more adaptable. So if you give them good things, I think they're much quicker and smarter at, at uh, uh, getting it. In fact, Macaques are known, and this, this is actually a study that have, have found, macaques are really good at bartering as well, so they can actually gauge at um, the value of things. So I think it's one site in Indonesia that the macaques no longer go for things like your bag or your plastic, they go straight for your passport. So oh, really? because they know <laughs> when they grab your passport, that you're going to throw a lot of food at them. So I think wow. it's just the fact that they, are, they, they learn behavior association very well. Fantastic. I mean, you have to admire that. Yes. Yeah, I, I mean, it's fantastic. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that's one of the charm of macaques, and that's why we relate to them so well. Okay, yeah. we're going to move on to Jolene and, and come you. to more of the interaction. Con yeah. Jolene, you're here. Wow. Okay, Hi, All right, let's, let's clear off and let you make your presentation. Jolene, of course, Lango Project Penang, and recently featured uh, in Primates in a documentary by the BBC, which we were so pleased about. Uh, let's try to get it, if you can, on... Um, and I don't know which you have to go and subscribe to something. Okay, Jolene, off you go. Right. Looks like it's working.
Ah, we, yeah, um, Jolene has gone now because the computer crashed. Uh, we will just continue to pull, uh, maybe ask Shamini some questions. Um, yeah, Shamini, are you there? Yes. All right. Okay. I think, um, and this is actually for Felicity as well. A lot of people are very curious about anything involving trying to get people to change, right? And and there were many questions, uh, which Ethan might pull up from people saying like, "Oh, how did you make? How did you bridge to oil palm growers?" Uh, how did you get people in the community to think differently about what they were doing? Uh, so, Shamini, for you first, um, uh, tell us a story about something that's been gratifying, that's given you encouragement and hope that change is possible, and these humans are trainable, or they can, they can, they can, you know, provi providing them with information and insight actually can make a difference. Yeah, and then okay. Steve next. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, one of the one of the situations, one of the first ones actually was in a situation where we had a bunch. So in a residential area, we had some uh, pro feeders in the area that were feeding macaques actively, and some of the other residents that weren't tolerating very well. And so there was an actual clash with the with the people. And so we got in between and we started engaging with them and just use science really to explain what is it that the natural diet of the macaque is. So these people. Um, yeah, so use science to explain what the natural diet is, what the impact of feeding is, how it changes their behavior. And, and just kind of coming up, I think we were very, we came very neutrally um, and realized that these people were not doing it with a bad intention. They actually had the good intention because they felt the macaques were not getting enough food. And so they just kept feeding these animals. But after engaging with them and them seeing the statistics and the information, it just completely changed. So we had about 15 people in the group. And by the end of that two-hour session, 13 of them immediately said, I'm never going to feed these monkeys again. Um, and I thought that was a, you know, a quick win after two hours for 13 out of 15. That's um, amazing. You don't get, you don't get yeah. everyone, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. But I think if you can change one individual in a family, especially a child, that changes the whole family's behavior. Yeah. It's really worthwhile. Okay. Um, so, Felicity, there were a slew of questions that people marveling at, at um at, uh, well, you know, really opening their mind to the fact that your stakeholders or the people that can be part of the solution are people who have always been conceived, perceived as people not caring about oil and returns at all. So perhaps you could answer this question from Lisa, which is, did you encounter challenges getting companies uh, to to give time and effort to orangutan conservation on their lands? Yeah, there's several, several other questions and thank you very much for the questions on that. And it very much is a process and we're in the first stage of work. And so we, uh, uh, the, the philosophy that I have with Pongo Alliance is we go where the people who are early adopters and then go from there. So we're very lucky. Um, the very first engagement we have, and we have six main companies that we're working with in this first phase of the project, not all of them want to be known. Uh, it's that sensitive a thing. Um, so it isn't an easy thing for them. And the, for, on the very first conversations is they had to make a commitment to do no harm to orangutans. Orangutans are still in danger in this landscape. And they had to be making a commitment to retain the forests that are within their oil palm plantations. So the other advantage we a little bit have with the orangutans in Kinabatangan is that we're working in a mature oil palm landscape. So it's a landscape that's changed over 20 years ago. Many of the times the oil palm plantations didn't even know orangutans were using the area until we told them they were. So uh, so it, 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 the, the sort of impact, the daily impact uh, is a bit different from an orangutan than it is from a macaque when people see them every day when they're trying to put their rubbish out. So, so uh, but, but it isn't, um, although we do have some very visionary um, forward looking companies and, and estate managers, it isn't everyone across the landscape yet. Uh, so, so uh, there are challenges, and there's a challenge. There's challenges based on fear, uh, challenges based on shock. They didn't know they were even there, and um, and and natural suspicion between what is the uh, you know uh, conservationists and industry don't have a a great history of getting on together. So the idea that we need to trust on both sides. So building that up is also 
a part of the process. Okay, Jolene is back again. But yeah, thanks, Felicity. It's, it's very much a process. And, um, I, you know, optimism is really important. Uh, but uh, the fact is all of us are humans and there is a capacity to, to see other points of view, you know? All right, Jolene's here. So we'll just, uh, let's give her the floor. <laughs> okay. All right, everyone. Hi, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, so Justine, can you hear me well? Yes, you're doing really well. Yeah. Go ahead. All right. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in until now, even though there's some glitches, because I have done a few sharings during MCO, and there's always a tech glitches. I guess everyone can relate, yeah? Okay, so uh, I'm the final panelist uh, for this session. Before Pahilitan, Miss Hani going to speak about some of the law, wildlife conservation law in Malaysia, and also quite a stressful moment for me. So thank you, everyone, for tuning in. So I'm just going to tell you guys a story, a story from a perspective of a student. I'm a student of Dr. Nadine Rupert, uh, currently in my final year of PhD, and I'm studying the adorable Dusky Langers. As you can see, this beautiful photo taken by Peter Ong. Dusky Langers, they are now endangered species based on the latest IUCN rate list. And today, I would like to share with you guys how community effort is so important in creating one of the successful pilot projects based in Penang, which is to establish a safe crossing for Duskies and other arboreal wildlife. So let's face the truth, like habitat fragmentation is a problem. I guess there's something wrong with my slides again. I can't move on to the other slides. Okay. okay. Justin, can you hear me? Going. Ethan, and can you go on my slide, up. please? Sorry about yeah. that. During rehearsal, it was fine, but then it just happened. This is no one worries. of the three laws for the last speakers, I think. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, participants, for staying with us. Mm. <laughs> oh, all right. Okay. So uh, this is one of the photos that we took on the left. On the right, on the right. Um, I guess you know, I think that's the most important. Yeah. All right. So this is the and for a more wildlife, for example, that's the language, we face difficulties in crossing from habitat patch to habitat patch. So, uh, can I have the next slide? And for urban wildlife, that's the language is also not a problem. I have to put your mic closer because oh, we can't hear you. Yes, can you hear me closer. Now? Yeah, yeah all right, okay. good. Okay, all right. sorry about that. Okay. okay, so dusky langers can be seen like hanging around urban areas, just like uh, what Shamini mentioned just now. The macaques uh, has created lots of uh, negative interface due to uh, like a uh, wrong perception towards the wild wildlife and for dusky langers as well. When habitat fragmentation happens, the dusky langers, they face difficulties in crossing roads or even crossing from habitat patches to patches as well. So if you see the next slides, these are different ways where the dusky langers utilize their limbs, their body to cross the roads. On the top left, you see a tree leaping crossing, which is why this is so important for the dusky langers to find tree co uh, connectivity to cross the road safely. And on the uh, bottom left, you have the uh, dusky langers crossing on the cable wire, yeah, which is happening daily basis, not only on the langers, but also other arboreal primates and also rodents. And uh, throughout our five years of research, we have observed multiple multiple road crossing activities of the dusky langers, macaques, and arboreal squirrels as well. Yeah, if you see the next slides, we're utilizing citizen science in research. So in these five years, LPP Langer Project Penang has established into a permanent community science project, which we create a platform for environmental education and also research for the participants, including residents, students, international volunteers to join us from being in the forest where they've been educated about the importance of primate watching to awareness and activities to even the next slides, watching the dusky langers by the road. I'm sure some of you may be shocked by this image like, how can the dusky langers roam by the road? There's actually many factors why do arboreal wildlife hanging by the road? They're supposed to be tree top species, right? They're supposed to be stay up in the trees. But for dusky langers, there are lots of uh, different food plants, which is around the fragmented area, which this photo was taken by the coastal highway. 
yeah, coastal way along the Telobahang region. And there are lots of coastal plants, including Ketapang or even a Sea Malaysia. These are the vital food plants for the dusky langers as well. So throughout these five years, we observe the way they cross the road and the type of food plants they're depending on. And at the same time, we receive lots of citizen reports regarding the road crossing activities of the langers and other species of arboreal wildlife. However, unfortunately, not every road crossing activity is the safe ending where they manage to pass to the other side of the forest. Just like this picture, this was happening after MCO, during the first week of our MCO, where we received a call from a local citizen in Bukit Matajam. Yeah? So as you can see, the dusky langers was hit by a car. But this doesn't happen just in Penang, even though our project is stationed in Penang, but we receive multiple citizen reports, including tracking all the Facebook updates in some Facebook groups as well. So in East West Highway Perak, you have uh, dusky langers or even multiple ro rodents and primate road kills as well. And the next slides. Even in Georgetown, Penang, this macaque was hit by a car due to feeding provision by the uh, tourists. So the resident told us that when the macaques were fed by the tourists, the macaques tend to be comfortable by the road or even sitting at the center of the road. And then accident happens where the vehicle accidentally hit the macaques, where the macaques are too comfortable and they refuse to move around. Next slide. And this was recorded in Mersing Johor, where plantain squirrels, supposed to be tree top species, they're also crossing the road due to lack of tree connectivity. Next slide. And this is a banded langer yeah, from Mersing Johor, recorded uh, along the highway. So as you can see, banded la langers, they're also one of the, uh, the species of uh, langers that we can find in Malaysia. And they're also one of the victims of a uh, roadkill as well. Next slide, please. So if we look at the wildlife road crossing signages, Peritan has installed more than 300 different signages across Peninsula Malaysia. And most of these are targeting large mammals like tapirs and uh, elephants. But what if we think about the arboreal wildlife like squirrels, like dusky langers, banded langers? Are there any safe crossing in Malaysia? So far, there's no safe crossing signage applicants on the arboreal wildlife. As you can see, these two photos are example from other country. On the left, you have Singapore. Singapore has been a very, very good example in trying to promoting coexistence between the non-human primates and uh, human primates as well. Like during construction, they would have a monkey crossing hotspot signage by the road, which alert the driver to slow down or even bumper to slow down the vehicle when they cross the road. Okay, and on the right, you have the example from Australia. Okay, um, yeah, these slides. And in Australia, they have lots of... Uh, Arboreal marsupials, they are crossing the road on a daily basis. So uh, a group of researchers, they are building uh, signages and also canopy bridges for the marsupial to cross the road safely. Okay, next slide. And these are the three examples. These three examples are canopy bridge example. I know the photos are kind of small, but later on when we highlight the pilot project in Penang, then you're able to see what is a canopy bridge and how does it look like. So on the top left is the one from Australia. They are building net structure, ladder structure canopy bridge to assist small marsupials and mammals to cross the road safely. And on the top right, of course, you have the banded langers yeah, doing a selfie, which is a very uh, good example for our neighboring country. And at the bottom is from Brazil. Yeah, so basically in Brazil, they are like a, a biodiversity of primates and rodents. And so uh, this net and X crossing bridges enable to like accommodate different types of animals, different types of uh, mochal lotion, and for the animals to cross the road safely. All right, next slide. So throughout these five years of research, in the beginning, we always thought that dusky langers only can be found in forests or even in uh, recreational parks, etc. Then we realized that there are so many different species of food plants. So far, we have recorded up to 30 species of coastal food plants and more than uh, 70 species of forest and secondary forest food plants that the dusky langers would feed on. They are highly adaptable species. So for them, they are kind of like dependent on the cable wire to move along. However, cable wire is not really that safe. So sometimes for the small infants and juvenile, when they fail to balance themselves on the cable wire, they will choose to road run instead. So this makes us think, what can we do to promote a coexistence between humans in vehicles and also non-human primates like dusky langers in Penang so that the primates can cross the road safely while we human able to learn and appreciate them at the same time. And this leads to multi-stakeholder conservation efforts. Next slide. 
In November 2017, we approached Aid Malaysia. They are a fantastic organization. So basically, one of their projects is to utilize the old fire hoses by a fire department and donate it to wildlife conservation group, like for example, Bruno Sambe Conservation Center for enrichment objects, and to us, Langer Project Penang to build fire hose bridge. Next slide. So as you can see, these are the fire hoses. However, there's two main different types of fire hoses. Uh, one is the exterior with the cotton material, and this one, the one that we use, is the exterior is the rubber material, which is a better grip for the primates and rodent, and also is slightly wider than the normal cable wire and almost a similar sign as the small branches as well. Okay, flash again. And these are the multi-stakeholder collaboration. So it took us around 10 months to obtain the permit in order to build the first urban canopy bridge in Malaysia by get getting the support letters from different NGOs and organizations. And next slide. And the main approval was approved by the JKR, Jabatan Kejaraya Malaysia, Malaysian Public Work Department, where we approached them and talked to them about the importance of arboreal crossing. And we need to start something. We need to start a pilot project in Malaysia so that more researchers and more citizen effort can be done because this is a multi-stakeholder uh, collaboration and partnership. So after meetings and meetings, and uh, we inspect the sites and we have an arborist to choose the right trees. And eventually we managed to build the uh, first urban canopy bridge in Malaysia. Next slide. All right. So this is a uh, urban canopy bridge and this was built in uh, Telobahang at end of uh, February 2019. And this is a plantain squirrel, which uh, actively crossing the bridge since day one until now. And so far, we have more than 350 different crossing of uh, a plantain squirrel, which is from coastal to the forest or even the forest to the coastal area. And next slide. And we also have the long-tail macaques. Guess what? Long-tail macaques, they, they, were, they, they were the first one who crossed the bridge since the installation of the bridge. Yeah, so they were very uh, hyperactive. They are so comfortable on the bridge, even stay in the middle of the bridge for feeding. But so far, they are coping quite well. And we have multiple sightings of the macaques even playing with our camera traps and crossing the bridge by using different ways. Okay, next slide. After nine months of the bridge installation, finally, we have the uh, Dusky Langer crossing the bridge for the first time. So there were many people asking us why Dusky Langers take so long. Yeah, because uh, first of all, the dusky langers, they are much more shy. And also the macaques, they cross first. And the macaques, they tend to kind of monopolize and to stay around the bridge area. So it takes a while for the dusky langers to get habituated to the crossing activities by looking at other primates in the example. And eventually during the coastal plant, footing season and flowering season, the dusky langers, they are able to cross the bridge. Okay, next slide. Pahilitan did came to our canopy bridge last year and look at the bridge design and they express support. They express that uh, this is a good initiative and really hope that uh, we're able to do more collaboration with Pahilitan, especially in speeding up the uh, approval. At the same time, able to get this implemented in the Malaysian environmental law in the future so that more places will not only have a crossing for uh, large mammals, but also arboreal wildlife as well. Okay, next slide. Okay, challenges ahead. Even though this pilot project is considered successful, however, we need more citizen effort in engaging in the conservation work. Like, first example, on-site monitoring. We need more volunteers to get involved to look at the crossing activities of the langers so that we can tell okay, what food plants they depend on and how many individuals crossing at a certain coordinates at a certain time of the day. And this, we can either do it uh, through a citizen effort like a maybe more creative method instead of on ground, like technology, etc. Next slide. And also natural canopy connectivity. So these two photos are taken at the same location. On the left, within the red circle, right, you can actually see a dusky langer leaping from the right to the left. So this is a natural canopy bridge of the dusky langer at the site. However, we realized that the contractor, yeah, they were trimming the tree in a kind of like brutal way. Yeah, which create a huge gap between the roads. So the dusky langers and the macaques, they can't cross that location anymore, which encourage them to road run even more frequent Yeah, after the MCO period. Next slide. We also need more awareness, more awareness for the residents to know what to do next when they encounter 
uh, road running activities of the arboreal wildlife or even injured wildlife by the road or worse come to worse roadkill cases so most people they will just choose to ignore but we hope that in the future there will be some kind of a like strategic platform it can be one of the apps or even a platform that citizen able to report and uh, maybe the authority prohibitan can gather statistics not only on uh, large mammals but also on this arboreal wildlife as well next slide funding and attention there are lots of uh, future plans under langer project Penang. Like uh, for us, we are looking forward in establish more urban canopy bridges, but this need a lot of uh, multi-stakeholder effort. Like now, we're only building the first bridge based on the uh, study groups that we observed for the past five years. But we need more reports and more information from the public in order to identify the upcoming coordinates to build the bridge at the right location and also to experiment with more different prototypes and design of the bridges in order to figure out what design of bridges is suitable for more animals to cross the road. Okay, next slide. Of course, in order to get this idea, the importance of arboreal crossing to be uh, stick into the mind of future generation, LPP is also very active through environmental education and the Habitat Foundation is one of the um, uh, funders for our environmental education efforts. Like this photo over here, you can see the kids they are actually building a uh, mock canopy bridge and trying to exhibit the movement of the langers from the bridge. Okay, next slide. And so this is one of the passion and also objective uh, under Langer Project Penang, which is trying to educate as many people as possible, starting from young ages. Like in this photo, this boy, uh, his, he, he drew a very, very nice like canopy bridge of a langer standing on the bridge. So there are many people, they have no idea that uh, monkeys, they also live in trees. They always think that snakes, reptiles, and birds, they live in trees. But for this thing is very fresh, it's very new. So this part of education on ever crossing should be spread among more different types of community and different niches of people. Okay, next slide. Okay, so the takeaway message to everyone is first to get involved, second to take action, and third to make a difference. Okay, next slide. So I would encourage everyone, if you see any roadkill incidents or even uh, road crossing activities, please report to Pahilitan or you can report to us because currently we are gathering all the different observations in Penang and other parts of Peninsula Malaysia. And on the left, you're able to see a map of Penang because right now we're building uh, this awareness poster for the people in Penang, yeah, which we're trying to call out that even though if you live in an urban setting, it doesn't mean that you can't see any wildlife crossing activities as well. Like macaques, they are roaming around uh, urban areas, like human impacted areas, neighborhood as well. So there's a chance of road crossing for these primates, not only around the forest reserve or even forested area, but also around our neighborhood. Next slide. And also, please, please, please engage with your community, with your friends in reporting wildlife crime. Miss Honey from Pahitan going to explain more about uh, wildlife crime in Malaysia later on. But uh, we always call for help, call for citizen help in order to report social media wildlife crime so that uh, my cat and Pahitan can gather the information and conduct the next, next step of the, uh, the activity. Okay, next slide. So these are some examples of the citizen Re reports that we received throughout these five years. So every time that people, they see langers uh, next to their house or even around the neighborhood, they will report to us by writing a number of individuals and the road crossing types, etc. And these are the information that help us to gather up and to plan for the next crossing hotspot for another urban canopy bridge. Okay, next slide. So, and also trying to uh, get the people engaged, give them courage to do the right thing. Because there are many people who call us, they have no idea what to do. So through education on social media or even uh, awareness talks or webinars like this, we're able to get the citizen have a closer approach and involvement with the authority so that they will know what's the second step and third step instead of just ignore and do nothing. Okay, next step. And of course, to contribute for wildlife conservation, you can always volunteer as citizen scientists. These are amazing interns of Langer Project Penang. They observe dusky langers, wild dusky langers in the forest of Penang and also different parts of Peninsula Malaysia where they engage out as a citizen scientist. Every time they observe dusky langers, they will contact us. And next slide. You can also volunteer as nature educator because nature education is so important, which we must uh, truly emphasize on this in order to get more people involved, not only as scientists, but also citizen scientists volunteering expect as well. Next slide. 
So I'm going to end this sharing with a photo from Peter Ong. And uh, the future of primates depends on us. And this is the purpose of this uh, webinar is to try to uh, stress on the urgency of primate conservation, which you and me of different background, we should really, really get involved in the primate conservation through different, different ways. It not, it, it's not just being in the field, being a scientist, but also to get the words out and volunteer in different aspects as your profession and uh, just do your best in everything you can. All right. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thanks, Jalim. You're as clear as crystal. Thank you so much. And so um, we're going to now, because of one, okay, let's be more organized. Recently, the dusky langurs were classified now as endangered, right? That's something that's yes. kind of a surprise and a shock. Um, it was really a wake up call for all of us. And it's clear that yes, while roadkill is a problem, a lot of wildlife crime and the pet trade really has something to do with it. And that's why we really wanted to get someone from Pahilitan to come on board. Uh, they play a major role in trying to crack down on these things. And uh, we need to uh, find out how we can support their efforts. And also to find a little bit more about how they are adjusting their laws to be more targeted to the, the way that social media enables these things to happen. So um, I'd like to invite Hani Nabilev, who is from the uh, Hidupan Liar Division, right? Conservasi Hidupan Liar. I'm trying to get used to the new names. <laughs> Conservasi Hidupan Liar of uh, Jabatan Pahilitan. Uh, Hani, thank you for joining us. And you have a presentation uh, that you've done up, so I'm just going to let you pull up your slides. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Justin. Okay, there's a little bit of feedback. So if you have something else on another device, just switch it off, yeah? Okay. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, uh, hi everyone, my name is Hani Nabilia binti Muhammad Sahini and I am from the Division of Wildlife uh, Conservation, Department of Wildlife and National Parks, Perhilitan. Actually, today I would like to share with all of you about uh, the laws, some cases of offences and penalties and also uh, the most important thing is how as a citizens, as a public, you can help us. And for the next slide. Okay, um, actually for Perhilitan, we are uh, using the Wildlife Conservation Act 2010 or also known as Act 176 uh, in Peninsula Malaysia. Uh, I will be focusing on Peninsula Malaysia and, and uh, for the species in Peninsula Malaysia, we have 11 species of primates which are listed in this law and about five species of primates which are totally protected uh, is listed under the uh, second schedule, including the gibbons. And while another species are listed under protected species in the first schedule, including the langurs. And uh, next slide. So uh, this is uh, just a, a little bit about the number of cases for keeping and smuggling primates from 2015 until 2019. Uh, as you can see here, the data provided by the enforcement divisions uh, record uh, that the primates um, have the highest category actually uh, for uh, involved in various offenses. But uh, for this uh, graph, uh, we will focusing on uh, the cases that for keeping and smuggling primates. Uh, as we can see, the, uh, the trend of this graph is increasing from 2015 until 2017. Uh, we can see the increasing from six cases for 2015, followed by 2016, uh, six cases, and uh, we follow up to 2017, where uh, it's about 50% higher of cases, uh, which is uh, total in 12. And on 2018, only dropped one case, and 2019 recorded the highest case. 
for this entire five years. And as you can see here, the species uh, that involved in these cases uh, includes nine species, which is uh, nine out of 11 is very uh, big for us. Um, and the species is include Macaca nemestrina, Macaca fascicularis, Nidisibus kokang, Trachipithecus obscurus, Hylobit slars, Simpalangus nidactylus, Hylobit agilis, Trachipithecus cristatus, and also Presbytis yamiti. So we have nine species out of 11. Next, please. So um, nowadays, uh, the biggest threat is the cybercrime. We are always aware about it. And from the data provided from 2018 until July 2020, primates the highest category, which involves various offenses. And until July 2020, about uh, 19 complaints have been received uh, regarding the ownership and illegal sales of primates. And usually, landlords and gibbons uh, were sold as a pets. And the price uh, from the data that we get, uh, it will be sold normally between 750 ringgit and until 1,000 per individual. Next slide. So uh, the most important thing, what people should know if they are caught to have the primates uh, with them. The first thing is, especially for the langurs and gibbons, uh, this is the offenses and penalties uh, that awaits for you. The first one is uh, actually for the langurs. The langurs is, is, uh, is listed in the first schedule of the act and it, is, uh, it will uh, be related to the section 60 that you can be fined not exceeding 50,000 ringgit or not more than two years imprisonment or both. And different situation if you keep the juvenile, which is um, will uh, be related to section 61 and the fine is not exceeding 100,000 ringgit or not more than five years imprisonment or both. If you happen to keep the gibbons, which is the um, which is uh, related to the uh, second schedule, which is the totally protected animal, uh, you might be charged with the um, with uh, section sixty eight, which is uh, the fine not exceeding hundred thousand ringgit or not more than three years imprisonment or both, and higher charges uh, for juveniles of gibbons which is uh, related to section 69 uh, to find not exceeding 200,000 ringgit or not more than 10 years of imprisonment of or both. So it, it is actually a heavy charges if you kept uh, the primates. Next slide. Okay, uh, actually uh, how as a public, as a citizen, as the other agency, how you can help us. So uh, we have two situations in, in here. Uh, the first one is, if you know the suspect, please um, provide us the premise address, vehicle, registration number, name, name contact number, and uh, other personal details. details. And um, if you find out through social media, uh, you could screenshot the status or post or also copy and provide the link of the website, Facebook, Instagram, and please provide to us. Uh, just uh, to, uh, to make sure that uh, you all understand, the data and information received by the department are confidential and of course, uh, you are protected. Just uh, so you know, after you got uh, all the all of the information, the pictures, the screenshots, you can uh, direct directly uh, uh, call us, uh, just like Jolin said before this, uh, through our hotline 1-800-88-5151. Also, you can log on to our website uh, and you can find uh, the buttons for e 1 
and you can lodge a report uh, through the system. And also, you can email to our email uh, official email address, which is the webmaster at wildlife.gov.my. Next slide. So, uh, for the reminder, actually, um, in terms of conservation, um, primates are not pets, primates are not belong to us, and primates only belong to the nature and wild. And if you stop the demand and stop the buying, the process of poaching will be decreased. And as we all already know, the demand will cause the family to be killed. To get uh, for one baby, for one infant, they have to kill their parents. And this is a very um, waste for the population. And, and as we know, the langurs and the macaques, uh, the status for IUCN is changing. And it become more endangered day by day. So play your role. And sometimes uh, people don't understand. Uh, people don't realize that there will be a future problems when the primates grows up and become matured. They are no longer suitable to be pet for human anymore. And people will try to release them back into the wild. As the consequences, they cannot survive because they are very highly uh, adaptable to humans. They need humans to feed them and we will lose another life. So I think that's the most important thing. Uh, do not support uh, the online uh, selling for wildlife, especially for primates. Yes, may, uh, maybe they are cute, uh, but just think for, for the future. So um, last but not least, and if you want to check out our official social media account, you can go to Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. We have daily updates in there. And don't forget, be our ears and eyes uh, so that uh, the uh, primates and uh, illegal wildlife trade uh, can be reduced. And we do hope uh, that as our um, as our tagline, Kidu Balia Untuk Generasi Akadatang, which is also known as um, Wildlife for Future Generation, we never uh, neglect any species in our conservation efforts, uh, including the primates. So uh, I would like to thank uh, all of you, especially the researchers, the agencies, and also um, the NGOs who always support the uh, in terms of uh, research, sharing knowledge, and giving opinions uh, towards a better conservation. Thank you. Oh, thank you, honey. That was really very gracious, a very clear presentation. Um, we're really glad that Pahilitan is taking a strong stance, uh, and I think the public will be very interested in they can feedback. Um, I think uh, on social media, I think one of the things is that people, uh, we are used to influencers, right, uh, posting cute pictures of animals. I think, uh, Ethan, you can bring all the panelists back on, yeah? Uh, but the funny thing is, I mean, the thing that I was raised by Professor Bunratana about the taking of selfies and wifis is something that even researchers do. And I think we need to socialize a uh, new behavior or a better standard because that actually does contribute to the problem. Uh, anyone want to jump in and, and uh, feedback on that? Honey? Yeah, so this business of taking photographs uh, and Jolene, this is something that drives you crazy, right? Yes, yes, yeah, because uh, there are many people, like, for example, seasoned scientists, when they fill up the application to volunteer with us, I'm mm -hmm. sure uh, most of you guys encounter. I'm sorry, yeah, I so cannot hear the questions. Yeah. Okay. Oh, no, this is about posting on social media with, uh, with, with, and with pets and or we're getting very, very close to wildlife. Yeah, but I'm going to Jolene finish your sentence. Okay, all right. So many people always think that uh, when we work with primates in the wild, we will have a chance to cuddle with them, etc. So it's very important to emphasize the importance of a safe system. Like Nadine also encountered lots of a similar situation as well. So there's still a lot of lack of awareness among the community that uh, non-human primates and human primates should always keep a safe distance. 
yeah, people always see a confusion between domestic pets and also wild animals. I guess this is really important to emphasize. First of all, as a researcher, we must set as good role models, good example, especially everyone is using social media now, nowadays, right? We have Instagram, we have Facebook, we have Twitter. A wrong photo, even though with an awareness caption, people might take it differently. Yeah, so I'm wondering, it's like, like during IPS Nairobi, we do stress on uh, this discussion, panel discussion on the uh, researchers uh, posing with uh, their study primates or even uh, people are circulating these photos in a while. So we're thinking like, is there something to strengthen this in order to get the words out there so that people won't do that? Yeah. Um, can I uh, just jump in? Um, uh, yes, Felicity. Yes. I'm a member of the... Uh, uh, IUCN specialist group in human primate interactions. And shortly, we are about to launch on our website an appeal for primatologists and anybody in volunteers who work with primates. Uh, we are going to have a little uh, page where people make a pledge, what well, has some information, and then uh, calling on people to make a pledge to not do this kind of selfie uh, behavior because it it is, it, it all, it not only doesn't help the situation that you're in or the research that you're trying to do as Jolene or Nadine have, but it also, it, 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 when they're telegraphed all over social media, it sends, it just perpetuates a pro, uh, um, the confusion about uh, of having a proper level of respect for primates. So Thanks, look that's really that great. What's, the what's the link again for that? Um, um, I don't, it's the IUCN specialist groups in human primate interactions. Okay, I know that. We'll paste that into the chat. Yes. All right, so Rexy's question is kind of cool because we, all right, so we know what we shouldn't do, but are there places where they've actually managed to try something different? It still allows people to appreciate them, but without feeding or impacting them. Anyone want to possibly, Shamin, Dr. Shamini, would you like to pick this one up? Yeah, um, so I'm, I'm not sure in Malaysia, um, or maybe I haven't come across it, but in Japan, I've seen it as well in with the Japanese macaques. Um, and in Japan, in one specific site, and not all of them do it right, but one specific site, um, they actually um, engage. So they've got a group of people that are sort of like the cat, caretakers or the feeders of, of the macaques um, and they give them very low energy seeds and it's it's actually a process that the person has to put on a jacket which is what identifies them as the individual that goes uh, and gives them this this uh, seed um, and they what they do is they just sprinkle the seeds around the tourists cannot take out anything and feed the animals but it just allows them to engage with with this animal I'm not saying that this is the right way but so far, this is the only, this is the the um, most ideal situation that I've seen. I, I think we can learn to do better. We can try to do better. But as as a, a visitor myself, you know, I, um, I I was quite impressed to see that nobody was feeding the macaques, nobody was touching, and because the macaques weren't getting food from people, they weren't bothered uh, by the tourists at all. So people got to interact with them in a sense. They got to take their pictures. But there was no such thing of touching or getting close to them. So from that perspective, I thought it, it worked really well. But obviously, from the feeding perspective, I'm not entirely sure. Okay. Well, we have we had so many good questions in the chat, and all of the panelists are going to go there and dig through and give you good, proper, thought-out answers. We've got one question, and that's really going to end this session. And that's from Yuan Zhao to all the panelists. With the recent updates in IUCN's primate species, protected status. What do you, each of you personally think would be the greatest challenge to better protect the species in both Malaysia and habitat states? All right, so this one is, uh, you know, looking at, uh, here it is. Okay, so um, uh, yeah, we have uh, a task ahead of us and we seem to be losing habitat so quickly, even more quickly than we can study species. Um, I'm going to start with Dr. Nadine. Yeah, um, thank you, uh, Yuan, but also thank you, Justin. You have kind of answer the question. I think habitat loss is and will be always the biggest challenge if human population keeps on rising and rising. So then you have all not just habitat loss where you lose the species, but also fragmentation, which we have addressed in this webinar to a large uh, content. So if you fragment landscapes and you do not provide linkages between the landscapes and maybe agricultural land or urban land, or any other fragmented landscape, you always have uh, the problem of not maybe losing a species now, but by um, preventing gene flow, by creating um, 
genetic, um, what we call bottlenecks, that these species will be impacted in the near future. And for the small apes or gibbons, that's a very, very uh, recent risk as well. We might still see them in, in forests, in small forest pockets, but they are not going to be there for long because their genetic diversity is so deprived. So habitat loss, habitat fragmentation is one thing that we need to address at many levels and especially at policy levels. But of course, everything else that we also have addressed now is to get people, get the public on board and voice out, be aware about what is happening and be aware that you cannot have them as pets. Know about the laws and what uh, Ms. Hani has said, know about the fine. And, and just we need to have that educational perspective, how we can create awareness and educate people. And that starts with the children already. So how can we uh, change mindsets and, and plant these seeds of getting the kids to know that this is an issue that they might be facing when they are adults, if they even see primates still around in 10 or 15 or 20 years. So yeah, that's my point on, on that question. But please, anybody else get ahead. And yeah, and say, um, one of the things that we have mooted, and I think in response to the IUCN assessment and this new understanding is that there definitely is a need for some kind of a platform uh, for us to collaborate much more effectively. Uh, I know we can't get to it right now, but I think that that's something that all of us, with Pahilitan, with people who work in front lines, the educating, working in sectors like oil palm and plantations want to get at. Uh, perhaps we are going to have a Future for Primates part two, by the looks of it, there's a need. Um, one of the things which also featured very much uh, in, this, in all of your sharings was the need for people who are not traditional primatologists, right? I think uh, uh, there's been uh, such a lot of breakthroughs, people who've got bring different types of skill sets. Peter, a photographer <laughs> and an educator and a, a you know, uh, communicator has begun to make inroads. Um, perhaps um, Felicity or Shamini or Jolene, you might want to comment on that. Uh, the need for more people of different types of competencies to come on board as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, all right. Um, for Felicity, you can go first. <laughs> uh, well, uh, um, uh, I think uh, I, um, really having an open mind and the more people that, that uh, are compelled to um, think that this is an important thing for us to share uh, is, is is for people to realize that they can contribute whatever their skill set is, um, and that really this the wanting to share a place for primates is a people problem, uh, the people primate problem, and so that it requires all of the skill sets of all of the people. And it also, uh, for young students who, who want to study wildlife and get very uh, thinking that it's all a doom and gloom situation, um, uh, I think that I, I think this panelist, we've shown a great example of, of all the types of work we're doing in changed habitats that I hope f makes them feel inspired. And, and people like Jolene who are, uh, are doing that type of thing. All right. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Felicity. I think uh, what you said just now is very important, which is on the people perception and conservation is also not only on protecting animals, but also changing people mind mindset. So what we encounter throughout uh, these five years in re recruiting volunteers is uh, instead of having an open mind, we must always uh, do the non-traditional way. Yeah. So instead of thinking like uh, what we researcher can do, uh, we must always think that what we can offer to the community. Like community, they want something more user friendly, first thing, and second, easy, accessible, and third, also flexibility. And we must target different types of volunteers instead of like being in the field full time, observing the monkeys. There can also be volunteers working from distance, like we're in Penang and a volunteer in UK. They can also help in the primates in not in their country, but other country as well. I think it's time for us to go the non traditional way and looking for more creativity options. But uh, for my part, the greatest challenge would be on partnership and collaboration. And like what we all mentioned that to get everyone on board on the same objective and to facilitate the project even faster and more efficient. I think this is one of the greatest challenges that we all face so far. Okay. I, I, I he just got his finger up. All right. Teaching next. <laughs> <laughs> I, I personally take an, take an inspiration from, from Jane's quote, uh, which she told me, you know, what you do makes a difference and you have to decide what, what kind of difference you want to make. And, and from that, you know, I, I, it just affirmed my belief that we should never underestimate the power of our, of our own voice. 
Um, we may be, uh, whether you're a, a child in school, whether you're a housewife, whether you're a, a professional worker or you're in the field, everyone has a role to play. We can influence our communities, our, our business leaders, our political leaders um, to do more. So it really all begins with us because as, as I've told many students that who've asked me about Project Monier, they asked me why I do it. I said, if, if we always leave it for someone else to figure, to figure it out, you know, it's always like, oh, it's the government's problem or it's Prohilitan's problem, but no, it's our problem. So I find it very heartening to meet so many like-minded people here. And I think, I think our primates stand a chance. So thank you all ladies for, for stepping up to the plate. You guys are awesome. <laughs> thank you, Peter. We, yeah, thank you for being we, uh, a brave man to join us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Um, okay, we uh, we have to end, unfortunately. Um, thank you so much to all the participants that took part and, and participated with your questions. Um, we just hope this is a springboard to future interaction. And uh, we will make sure that all these resources are out there. Reach out to us anytime. If there's something that you want to, to try out or uh, use us uh, as a sounding board to share information, Thank you, Hani, from Pahilitan, uh, and Chitaupe, uh, Dr. Kadir, for letting you all come here and be with us. Um, and thank you, everyone. And uh, we, we have to sign off now. So uh, last words, anyone, just say, have a nice thank lunch. You. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye. 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 Um, okay, I'm just, uh, you don't have to stay, but um, we are going to plug our next uh, webinar, web forum. We, um, Ethan's, we, we are a Fast and Furious going to have a web forum expert series number three. And for <laughs> this, we are inviting Prof Amran, who is a bit of a legend in the tourism conservation interface. And uh, he is going to uh, help us learn about, um, no, we're going to have a discussion, a two-part workshop starting on the 8th of August. Uh, the slide that's up now, uh, next slide, Ethan. Uh, this is the one. Okay, so please uh, save it, subscribe to our YouTube channel. This is going to be a must-see. Uh, Prof. Aman is an IUCN regional counselor and he is great for out-of-the-box thinking and we're really going to workshop this problem that all of us are faced with. Okay, all right, talk to you soon. Bye. 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 <laughs>